bit about myself. It was just two people at one point. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. I can't say why I am 100%, but I am back here. They decided that I should be, and I'm happy about that. I'm, I'm very happy you're here. You know, my other life outside of this Canada Reads thing is comedy, and comedy is affected by the weather. It is, it's not pleasant weather, and that didn't stop you from all coming here, and there's an overflow into the atrium, so give yourselves a big round of, a, of applause for championing literature the way you do. And uh, yeah, because weather affects comedy. Literature beats out comedy all the time. That's, that's of course terrible news for my principal career, but it's great news for Canada Reads. We're gonna get this thing started very quickly. I just wanted to give away a few things. Is that, how do you feel about giveaways? Is that, you should feel good about that in general. If you, most of you would have held on to some raffle tickets that you, uh, that you got when you came in, so. Get those out. Does everybody's raffle ticket starts with a, start with a 510? All right, and let's start after that. 5952. Oh my God, is a great reaction. All right. You don't even know what you're winning. Oh, you could stay in your seat if you like. Not, not to, I know, I, that was such a wonderful reaction. I'm so sad to, to stop you in your tracks. Your enthusiasm was amazing and infectious to everybody around you. Uh, but just to continue your enthusiasm, what we're doing, our sponsor this year is Rakuten Kobo. And we are giving you a $25 gift card for Kobo. Even if you don't have a Kobo device, you can download the app on, on uh, you know, Android or iPhone. Or you can have a desktop one and you can listen to audiobooks or you can read an ebook. And that's $25 in that direction. That is for you. So a nice round of applause for this lady over here. The way you'll get that, by the way, is you will keep that ticket and show it to uh, one of the CBC Books people. They will have headsets. And yeah, look for somebody with a headset. Hopefully nobody wore a headset for no reason today. They, you, that's not gonna be helpful for you. All right, next person to win a $25 gift card is 5991. Yeah, all right, great. Also good enthusiasm, wonderful. 5991, hold on to that card. You also have a gift card, which I will also, I can just keep these in my pocket, I think. And, oh, I can give them to Tara Mora. Can we have a nice round of applause for Tara Mora, who leads the CBC Books Canada Reads team? Finally. And then the winner, final, of this particular prize is uh, 6105. Is somebody okay there? Have they literally lost their breath and need resuscitation? You're okay? All right, congratulations. $25 uh, Kobo gift card for you as well. Wonderful, and now one more giveaway. One more giveaway. I would, it's a sign. Okay, yeah, we'll, do, we'll do the one that's fell out. I think that makes sense. As I split my pants bending down for them, that would have been great. All right, this is, um, you know the gasper in the back, you could have gasped about that. That would have been great as I pull out this big. This is a Kobo device. Yeah, this is the future of e-reading right here. I don't know if that's their saying. I just made that up right there. But that's, uh, that sounds good. So that is a Kobo reader. It is called the Kobo Aura H2O. It is apparently wonderful, Tara Mora tells me. Um, 6013 is the winner of that. 6013, good for you. Just put up your hand like you were answering a question in history class, just so. All right, well, congratulations to you all. And uh, again, the headsets give you the ticket. Cold from the back here, what's happened, no? All right, well, good for you guys. That's a good start to the night. We're gonna get it started. The host this evening is, uh, is somebody who's hosted Canada Reads in the past, is very familiar with this show, and you will know her every afternoon. You hear her voice on Here and Now. She's fantastic. Jill Deacon, everybody. Give her a nice round of applause, and I will see you in March. Hey, my friends. Hello, hello. Yes, I am Jill Deacon, wearing a Britney Spears microphone this evening. This is so 
Um, something to get used to. I feel like I need to break out my dance moves. Um, welcome, everybody. Yes, as Ali mentioned, uh, I am the host of Here and Now on uh, weekday afternoons on your CBC radio. Yeah, a few listeners here. Okay, good. Um, that's where you want to be uh, getting. It's nice to be part of a, uh, a, a fantastic radio show, of course, but also a great platform to celebrate books as we do every week on, uh, on Here and Now. Um, and always big champions and supporters of Canada Reads, so I'm really happy to be here tonight. Um, I want to start by saying uh, and acknowledging that the land on which we uh, are spending this evening and gathering is the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. And tonight, as you know, we are all here to um, meet and get to know a little bit the five panelists, the champions, the defenders of uh, the big books this year on the shortlist, and also the authors who wrote them. This is kind of a rare occasion in Canada Reads to um, have all of these uh, 10 folks gathered together at the same time. Um, it's a rare opportunity, so good on you for being a part of it. I will take my seat now. Sorry, no Britney Spears dance moves. Um, and kick things off by, we're going to start off by a little chit-chat with the panelists. Uh, from right here in Toronto, please welcome fashion icon, media personality, Ms. Jeannie Becker. There she is. From Battlestar Galactica and the new Netflix series Altered Carbon, please welcome actor Tamil Peniket. All right. She has been called the Oprah of Afghanistan. She is Vancouver-based singer, songwriter, and activist, Mojda Jamaljada. Please welcome her to the stage. From Regina, I don't get to say this every day, Tornado hunter and severe weather expert, Greg Johnson. And finally, please welcome Toronto's own singer, songwriter, extraordinaire, Ms. Julie Black. All right. Yeah, so as I said, you guys, this is a rare opportunity for people to get a, a, a sense of who you all are um, before you, I don't know, put on your boxing gloves. So uh, you've all met, what, in the last day? Have they had you at events and things before today? Have you been just doing yesterday. a little... Just uh, yesterday? Yeah, just met yesterday. And? <laughs> we hate each other. There's some Did big the begin to fly? There's some big personalities. Some big personalities here? Very mm -hmm. big personalities and big glasses. <laughs> well, it's hard, right? Because you know, you know, you're at this stage, and tonight we are going to stay far away from any strategies and any plans for how you intend to destroy each other in a matter of weeks. But it's you are in your, you know, introductory, convivial, cordial best, knowing that you won't necessarily stay that way. <laughs> so how is that? Uh, I think we're gonna remain pretty nice because oh. they've all decided that. I'm gonna win. She's <laughs> <laughs> in survivor mode. <laughs> She's yeah. already picking alliances. I, I did say, I say, you know, every reality show and all these, the black person always gets voted off first, or the, oh. the horror, <laughs> the horror movies, they die first. So you know, we're already gonna do it different and make sure the black girl don't get off the show first. <laughs> <laughs> Julie was trying no to make pressure. deals yesterday. And it's Black History Month going on. Julie you know asked what? us I right away within five minutes of meeting us. She's like, well, which one of you wants to lose right away? So if we just decide that, you know, right off the bat, then we can, we can make this easy. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's a lot less stress, Julie, if you, uh, if you go out first book. <laughs> we do it different in Canada. <laughs> Don't we? We build bridges, not walls, right? Um, I have to uh, ask you, I got the chance to, to talk to Jeannie about this today. I interviewed her on here now this afternoon. Um, and, and I can ask you this again too, Jeannie, but, but like what, 
I know why I love Canada Reads. I think a lot of Canadians, certainly everyone here tonight, probably has a, their own sort of special relationship with, um, with this long-standing kind of institution that the CBC put together. What, did, what drew you guys to do this? I mean, you know, you have to put a lot of work in, you have a lot of reading to do, it's like being back in school, you have studying and strategizing and thinking, and, and um, I wonder why you, I'll start with you, Jeannie, because we did start the- nuts. I mean, for me, it was really, uh, wanting to be out of my wheelhouse a little bit, you know, out of my comfort zone, uh, wanting to get a little bit headier than I normally get the chance to be, and uh, wanting to um, yeah, push myself. You know, it's that old thing of wanting to do uh, something at least once a day that scares you. Uh, this, this does scare me. It really <laughs> does, and it did feel like being back at school, back at university, when you had to, you know, a reading list of stuff that you might not normally want to read. Uh, and even though, you know, you start reading the stuff, you think, what am I reading this for? And, and, and some of the stuff was pretty gritty. I mean, some of these books were like really gut-wrenching. Um, because you had a big long list from which you had to whittle down yes, and find exactly. the one that you... Yeah, but, that but you even <laughs> then reading some of them, I haven't read all the books just yet, but I have read three of the five. And, you know, I, I took uh, one in particular on vacation with me, and it was like, wah not exactly like vacation reading material. <laughs> However, that being said, I wanted to- Not naming names, I think it's, it's good. No, it's like, <laughs> it's, in, it's in a wonderful thing to, uh, to push yourself in, in to places that you wouldn't normally go to, you mm -hmm. know, just voluntarily or off the bat. Uh, and it's wonderful uh, to learn that way by surprise. Um, Greg, what about you? Well, I mean, for me, uh, I kind of see this, probably for all of us, it's a bit of a soapbox. Um, because we get to share our vision uh, of how you know we felt when we read these books, and, and uh, I think we live in a pretty amazing time right now, and and, and we, we see things every day when we turn on the news or get on Twitter, and there's uh, you know some pretty crappy stuff going on in the world, and and uh, I see this as a soapbox to be able to to share our, our vision of uh, you know where we see Canada going, where we see our society, and. And uh, I'm just happy to, honestly, my guidance counselor from high school would never saw this coming. <laughs> uh, I'm I thought, just, I I'm just super gonna... thrilled to be here. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, I'm just happy to be indoors where it's safe and there's no flying objects flying through the air. Moshe, what about you? What drew you to be part of Canada Reads? Well, actually, I've been obsessed with reading books since I was a little kid, and um, I used to spend my lunch money buying novels. So for me, this is a really natural thing, and I'm like, wow, I get to read books, and I get them for, you know, I get them shipped to me for free. <laughs> I don't have to spend my lunch money, so <laughs> it's really amazing for me. But um, it's almost like when I got the call for Canada Reads, I'm like, I'm going to drop everything and do this because this is a dream come true for me. Like, I, I was almost like, how did you guys know I love books? You know, mm. how did you know I love reading? So well, the CBC Books team, they do their homework. They, they know, really they do, know all. yeah. So I'm, I'm really glad to be here. And of course, you know, I've had debates in school and all that stuff, but, and, and I always love winning, but sitting in, uh, near, you know, Jeannie Becker <laughs> and <laughs> Julie Black, I am like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Get used to losing. <laughs> hey, being one of my favorite singers, you, you know, well, I can't say that because my author's, you know, watching me right now. So, Otherwise, practice losing. I, I'd love oh, to have it. Ho, ho. <laughs> Julie, what about you? Have you always loved Canada Reads? Have you? What, what were I'm your thoughts? I'm totally when honest. I said, what rock was I under? 18 years. This thing been going on since I was two, and I had <laughs> no idea. That it's been around this long. Um, I love reading, but I read the same things. And I realize that you, it's no different than, than your nutrition. You eat the same things, you listen to the same music, you read the same things. It's like, it's a lot of the same happening. And I realized that I would not go to Indigo and choose these, just choose my book. That it wouldn't be a book I would choose. Uh, you know, so I was like, you know what? Let me do this. Yeah. And all these five books totally like opened my eyes. Um, and I also want to inspire my community, keeping it real. Like, hey, you know what? Let's start reading some other things, you know? And in Canada, we speak about diversity, but let's live it now, let's support our authors. The whole literary com community is it's huge, it's growing, and I feel like a, a, a huge parallel as an artist, as a musician in this country, um, where the struggle is real, and so if we could fan each other's flame, why not? Mm. Love it. <laughs> and Tama, what about you? What uh, drew you to take part in Canada Reads? Um, I mean, number one, I'm a, I'm a book lover. I love reading. Um, 
like Jeannie said, I think the challenge of it too. I mean, that's something that definitely attracted me. Um, you know, I got, I got uh, called a number of years ago and asked if I wanted to be a presenter at the, uh, the Inspire Awards. And I was like, that is terrifying. I've always seen other actors or people do that, and that actually terrifies me. I'm like, I gotta do it. Something like this, debating on live television, a bunch of books with, with this team of sharks. I mean, that's terrifying. <laughs> I'm, I'm game, though. I'm game. It's exciting. It's funny, uh, we were talking about teachers and stuff just back in the green room, and uh, my cousin heard me on the radio today, and she, you know, she made a little comment on Facebook. I don't have any fans on there or anything. It's mostly family and friends. <laughs> and my grade six teacher was like, <clears throat> she's the only one. Everyone was like, congratulations. Oh my God, that's amazing. Canada Reads, fantastic. Congrats. And she was like, what is this? Question mark. This is my grade six teacher, who's a fantastic teacher, by the way. But she said, what is this? And I, I, I just, right away, I wrote her back. I'm like, you're gonna have to look it up. And I said, <laughs> yeah, I felt good about writing that. I'm like, you're gonna have to look it up. And I said, and if you feel bad about uh, that C minus you gave me in grade six, <laughs> I'll understand. Because <laughs> your boy made it. So we know who you're out to impress come March. It's okay. her. I'm, <laughs> the still, grade six I'm teacher. still wounded by that So C guys, minus. I'm hearing a bit of a thread, not totally maybe consistent through everyone, but you know, understandably there's maybe some jitters going into this. So just in the final, you know, we'll do this like a quick lightning round here. Your your strategy for victory. Not you don't have to get, you know, you don't have to give anything away. But between now and the last week of March, as you prepare and read each other's, you know, books and any any thoughts on how you're gonna how you're gonna take the title of the one book that Canada needs to read to open their eyes this year? Well, I'm gonna console all of them as they cry <laughs> and uh, pray for them. I'm gonna offer vegan eats and um, just get them just get them real healthy. Okay, Moshta. Thoughtful. Um, well, I have my strategy is to try to not like the other books, <laughs> which is really, really difficult to do because as I'm going through them, I think it's going to be an impossible task. But um, I think I'm so passionate about this book myself that I think it's just going to come out naturally. So All right. no strategy needed. Jeannie? Yeah, I think it's all about passion at the end of the day. And I've always believed that if you speak from the heart and you speak the truth, uh, hopefully others will see the light. I mean, the problem is that we're all so passionate <laughs> about these books, so I don't know. I just can't imagine what's going to happen. I don't, I, again, I hate the idea of competition and strategizing, and we'll have to see uh, how things unfold organically. Tamil? Same thing. I just got to do my work. I got to study, break it down, know these books sideways, figure out the hard part is going to be being critical about the other books. You know, I, I haven't read them all, but they're, they're all very interesting in their own right from what I've heard already, and that will be the difficult part. It's preparation, man. That's the key. All right, Greg, last word well, to you. Well, for me, I mean, uh, I'm not going to be critical of the other books. They're all fantastic. Uh, uh, there's one in particular that, I mean, if it wasn't, uh, if it wasn't for uh, getting a chance to read Craig's book, Precious Cargo, um, <laughs> I, you know, I probably would have picked. They don't I, vote. I, I, I probably, I probably would have picked it. But uh, my my tactic is going to be um, pulling Craig's words out of this book because it, he's mm -hmm. got some in incredible uh, messages and, and, and in incredible things that I just can't wait to quote. And and by pulling those out and uh, using them, I'm going to hopefully leave the uh, rest of the panel speechless. Which in Julie's case. <laughs> This is going to be really difficult. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, but I'm going to try. It's a great pleasure to have you all here together, I think, for the last time publicly until the games begin. So a big hand for these guys. Um, they'll all be out here sort of in combination throughout this evening with their writers. I'm going to allow the other four of you, other than Jeannie, to, uh, to take a little break backstage. Jeannie's going to stick around um, here. We're going to have do it this way where we have sort of one-on-one -on -one conversations with panelists and their authors. So in that spirit, let's bring out Mark Sakamoto, who is the author of Jeannie Becker's book, Forgiveness. Thank you. smokes.
<laughs> to her. All right, I'll just project. Oh, it's back. Okay, very good. Um, okay, so Mark, how, how do you like that round of applause? That's not part of a, an author's typical day-to-day <laughs> -day <laughs> experience, getting a round of applause from, a, from an audience. So um, enjoy that. Um, let's start, you know, a lot of people won't be familiar with these books. I mean, obviously some people will have read um, them going into this, but you're getting a lot of fanfare now and drawing a lot of people to your books for the first time. So, Forgiveness, um, it's an account of a, of a true story. Um, some of the books on the list this year are fiction and some are nonfiction. Um, and so your book is um, about your grandparents. It's a story that's almost, it, you know, it almost seems fiction because um, it's so hard to believe it's true. Tell me a little bit about um, the experiences um, in the Second World War and things of your grandparents that led you to create your memoir, Forgiveness. Sure. Um, before I do that, uh, I do need to say thank you very much to CBC and CBC Books. Uh, we've been here for 48 hours now, almost straight, and uh, everybody has been really, really terrific, and it's such a great platform for Canadian literature, so mm -hmm. please let a huge round of applause for <laughs> CBC and CBC Books. Uh, my book is a, it's a, it's a family memoir uh, during the Second World War, two sides of my family um, on the West Coast. Um, my grandma and grandpa Sakamoto were Japanese Canadian citizens. They were both born in, uh, in Canada. They couldn't vote yet, but they were citizens. And they really, there, oh, while there was a lot of um, racism around in, in British Columbia at that point in time, they really, they were both well educated and they, they felt that they could really rely on their citizenship and uh, that all of the bad rumors that were happening and floating around could never really come to pass. Um, of course they did, and uh, my grandparents were forcibly removed uh, 100 miles, uh, at least 100 miles inward, all 22,000 odd souls, Japanese Canadian souls. And they, my grandparents uh, were moved to a chicken coop in southern Alberta where they spent the war um, baking in the sun and, and uh, freezing in the winter, drinking slew water. It was really, it was really uh, terrible. On the other side of the country, my grandpa McLean, Ralph Augustus McLean, uh, like most boys wanted to, he was living a pretty hard scrabble life in Ile de Madeleine, uh, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And he wanted to get off the island and he wanted to go, you know, fight with, uh, fight for Canada and fight, uh, fight in Europe. Lied about his age and he was sent to Hong Kong, uh, which fell on Christmas Eve of 1941. And he spent the entire war, as we know, the Second World War, uh, at the other end of a Japanese bayonet. And he watched um, his, uh, his buddies die the most horrible, uh, horrific deaths possible. And uh, so it's a story of their, those injurious years, but it's, a, it's so that sounds very dark, um, which a lot of it is, but um, like Leonard Cohen says, there's a, a crack in everything and, and that's how the light gets in. And, and really the light came from their heart and they found forgiveness and they used that as a tool to um, move forward. Um, Jeannie, tell me a little bit about... Um <laughs> Your um, parents were Holocaust survivors, um, and so you two grew up with wartime stories. Um, t talk a little bit about how, you know, that your own personal experience influenced your reading of Forgiveness. Um, I grew up with so many wartime stories. Uh, as a child, I remember hiding under the bed because I didn't want to hear any more war stories, unlike uh, so many Holocaust survivors that really just kept it inside and, and were reluctant to talk about their experiences. My parents, I guess, found it um, very therapeutic and they had nobody else to talk to because those were the days when there was a, a stigma about you know going for psychological help and they didn't have uh, other family members because they'd all perished in the war and um, we didn't really, they didn't have any friends, you know, having just immigrated here in 1948. So my sister and I, we're the listeners here, and uh, it, it just drove us a bit crazy, but as, uh, as I started to grow and grow up and experience my own personal tragedies, and you know, as, as I say, I don't think anybody escapes from this life unscathed. It's all relative, of course. Um, you know, the experiences of, of my parents or, or Mark's grandparents are just so horrifying, yet still, I think, uh, these horrifying things happen to uh, you know everyday people you know all the time, uh, so 
it was my parents' voice inside my head, my parents' voice always talking about never giving up and uh, not being afraid that really saw me through everything in, in my life. Um, and their whole, their whole will to have that kind of forgiving spirit. Uh, you know, coming to this country, they thought this was the promised land. You know, they joke later that, you know, they didn't realize that you'd have to break your back to pick up the gold. You know, they, everyone thought, well, gold is lining the sidewalks. Yeah, but you had to kill yourself to get it. But they really, really instilled in me such a love of this country, even though it was obviously far from the, the perfect place that uh, they thought it was to begin with. Um, so reading this story, it just, it was, it was like my story, like Mark's epilogue, you know, at, at the end of the book is just something that I would have written to my parents. So, so bang on, and I just felt that this guy is a kindred spirit, you know, from another generation. He's the, the generation of my kids, but how brilliant that he wants to keep on telling these stories because it is all about forgiveness and letting go if you want to keep moving forward. The most important thing, though, is just never, ever, ever to forget and it's through the storytelling that uh, hopefully we never will forget. How does it feel, Mark, to hear, um, well, to hear that kind of appreciation and real connection with your story, but also to know that that's who's going to bat for you in this. You know, your work is done, right, in Canada Reads. You've written the book. It's kind of off to the defenders now. So to know that there's somebody who connects so deeply with your story and your writing. Um, yeah, I mean, forgiveness is in terrific hands uh, over the next couple of months. Um, right off the bat, um, you know, the Wranglers had to like pull Jeannie and I apart uh, because we were talking so much, and there were so many, um, so many uh, similarities in our f in our family story that we really um, she understands, I think, deeply the kind of trauma um, that that were that that. Um, is on, that are on the pages, but also the pivot. And um, Tell me what, you mean by the pivot. what I mean by the pivot is, you know, in, in her own family, they didn't dwell on, on those injurious years. They moved forward. Uh, they raised a wonderful human being who's gone on to do incredible, incredible things. And the only way to do that is to let th that past, those injurious years, um, not dwell in your heart. And so I think she, re it, it's a very, it's a different story, obviously, different people um, uh, and, and, and a different geography, but, but the timelines are similar and the themes are uh, bang on. They're exactly the same. Um, yeah, it's, your connection is pretty cool. Um, that, yeah, we'll see as, as the other um, authors and, and uh, their defenders come out here, whether that's the same. I know each, uh, each panelist chooses the book, so you're obviously drawn to this story, but it sounds like you guys have a, a pretty remarkable connection. So We're camping next weekend. So <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's great. It's really good. All right. Well, thanks to both of you um, for being here. All the best, um, and yeah, as I say, now you just have to sit back and let Jeannie do all the work, right? Oh, yeah, <laughs> I, I really, I do look forward to it big time. Uh, really look forward to turning the nation on to uh, this incredible story um, and uh, the way this amazing young man tells it. I'm impressed. I know you will be too. Thanks so all much, right. Jill. Thanks, guys. Mark Sakamoto and Jeannie Becker, forgiveness. Bye. All right. Yep. Okay, so let me call out, with my loudest voice, I will call out um, our next panelist and our next author. The book is American War. The author is Omar El Akkad. And the defender is Tamo Peniket. Come on out. Is that better? Hey guys, nice to see you. All right, so uh, Omar, I'll do the same thing. I'll get you to start by telling um, people a little bit about American War. I want to start though by telling you that uh, last summer, I guess it was, when I had a chance to interview a bunch of different book reviewers and, and just book enthusiasts on the radio and t talk about sort of best books to read for the summer and, and um, 
and uh, you know, best book of the year kind of thing, your book was on almost everybody's list. It uh, kept coming up. So um, you've already got a lot of fans of your book. For people who haven't... Um, like our work is done here, right? <laughs> We're good to go, right? For people who have not yet come, uh, got a copy of American War in their hands, um, tell, me, uh, tell us a little bit about it. It's, it's partly um, inspired by your work as a journalist. So maybe start there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, first of all, for that morale booster. Whether <laughs> it's true or not, uh, I, no, I appreciate true. it greatly. Um, the last event of my, of my hardcover book tour was a stop in Tampa where I, the audience consisted of three people. Um, <laughs> two had shown up because they, quote, had an Egyptian friend. <laughs> and the third guy, I think, was there by accident. <laughs> um, so to be sitting here in front of this room is, is daunting, to say the least. <laughs> um, Please bear with me. Um, American War is the story of a second American Civil War. Uh, it takes place about five or six decades from now. Um, the America of that time period is a very different place. Climate change and rising sea levels have essentially wiped out the eastern seaboard. Florida is underwater. About 100 million people have moved inland to get away from the storms and the rising seas. And long after it would do any good at all, the federal government decides to impose a prohibition on fossil fuels to combat all of this. Um, even though by this point most of the world has moved on to other sources of fuel, um, a number of southern states decide that they would rather secede than go along with this. Uh, what follows is a second civil war, um, the kinetic part of which lasts a very short time. The South loses again, um, and then the story starts. The story starts in the, in the tail end of this war, uh, and it focuses in particular on a single family, the Chestnuts, who live in southernmost Louisiana. And it's effectively what the story of what the war does to this family. Um, it's a story in particular of a, a young woman named Surratt Chestnut, who's the central character in American War. Mm. Tell me a little bit about how your work as a journalist, um, I know this is the first, it's not the first novel that you've written, but it's the first that, that's been published. Um, tell me a little bit about your other work as a journalist and how that kind of contributed to, to, this, to that kind of setting, the kind of story that you wanted to tell here. Sure, yeah. Um, so there were three novels before this. Uh, they never left the hard drive. Um, it's no big secret, they weren't very good. Um, and in fact, American War was also not going to leave the hard drive, and then I had a bad day at work. Um, I had a bad day at the Globe, and I, I decided to try my luck, and I got very, very lucky. Um, a lot of the things I saw over the ten years I spent as a journalist worked their way into the story, um, some in, in a kind of superficial level. So for example, a lot of uh, the story takes place in a refugee camp called Camp Patience. The layout of Camp Patience is very closely based on um, the layout of the Kandahar airfield in Afghanistan, and also this place called Camp Justice in Guantanamo Bay. Um, so superficially, the scenery is, is based on things I saw. Um, but thematically, it also worked its way in. Um, in terms of, of just a kind of symmetry that I would see in covering different stories, um, so the example I like to give is, is um, I was a journalist for 10 years, I was tear gassed twice. I was tear gassed when I was covering the um, Arab Spring protests in Cairo, and I was tear gassed when I was covering the Black Lives Matter movement in Ferguson, Missouri. And that's not to say that being in one of those places suddenly gives you a heightened <coughs> understanding of the other part, simply that a lot of the visual language was the same. You know, a heavily militarized police presence, a population that was so fed up that they were willing to go out into the street and face this militarized police presence. There were echoes. And since my book is concerned with this kind of universality of revenge and universality of reaction to injustice, those echoes played a big role in how I formed the book. Tamo, um, tell me what drew you to, uh, I think what people can, you know, already, you know, there's a pretty dark premise to a dystopian, futuristic, um, you know, post-climate change disaster novel. What drew you to that? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the book speak for, speaks for itself. You know, he's so eloquently s spoken about the novel at length. I, I, the fact is, a lot of these issues he's speaking about are on the forefront of the news today. They're real issues in the world that we're all worried about. You know, we're, we're directly affected by anything that happens down south. There are real tensions happening hmm. south of the border in the United States. And that, uh, that affects us as, uh, you know, our, our big brother to the south. We share a border with them. We share a continent with them. We're North Americans. Um, climate change is real. Um, eroding coasts is real. Racism, sexism, fake news. These are all real issues that are, um, you know, that, that I personally am 
concerned with, and I think a lot of us are. It's, it's unsettling how plausible his take on the near future is, and that's part of the thing, that's one of the real things that clicked with me, you know, when I read the book. I was like, this is, this is something people need to pay attention to. It had me within the first 15 pages, 100%. That's always very telling of a good book. And do you find, and I guess I'll ask both of you this, um, would you say, uh, is the book hopeful? In, you know, given all... Um, yeah, I'm trying it. to sell copies here because I feel like at some point somebody's going to... Um, <laughs> look, there, there's a line in the book where somebody says, you know, um, hopelessness is no impediment to hope. Um, the notion being that, you know, I, I, my existence is reliant on having hope. Um, and, and the book is not, it's not a happy book. Uh, it couldn't be. I couldn't have written this book um, and given it the kind of conclusion where people could walk away and say, oh, everything worked out. That's not, that's not how I could write this kind of book. Um, hope for me is a prerequisite because the alternative is to accept a world where a large number of the people in power would rather I not exist. Um, and so I think there's, a, there's a, a tendency to conflate the idea of hope with the idea of easy answers. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a hopeful book. It's not a pleasant one. I mean, yeah. It's well said. There, you know, it's compl it's not completely hopeless, but I think I think it's it's it's. <laughs> Let me go with that a little bit, <laughs> without giving away too much. Um, it's 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 a responsibility, and I think it's I think it's a brave responsibility that he took upon himself to write about these issues. Oftentimes, and I've sp <coughs> spoken about this a couple times today, and I'm happy that I wasn't too far off track when I finally had to have a conversation. Got to have a conversation with Omar yesterday, but you know these we're inundated with with media and press about extreme acts of violence and conflict in the Middle East and different parts of the world. It's far away. At a certain point, we shut off to it. We have to. There's another bombing in Afghanistan. There's another bombing in Afghanistan. There was just another bombing yesterday. Hundreds of people died. You know, it's because it is so far away. For many of us, we can shut off to it. We we've, we've become quite apathetic at times. We also feel helpless, like what can we do about it? <clears throat> and I think that's a problem today. We've got borders closing, there's more intolerance than there's ever been. It's a very, it's unsettling. He's done a brilliant thing by bringing this story, bringing these conflicts, bringing these, um, you know, this, this violence and these struggles of these people and the survivors and put it in our own backyard. And it's, it's, it's impossible for you not to empathize and to feel for these characters in the story. And it brings it home to you and it makes you realize it is, these are real issues that we have to do something about. And I don't have the answers, I'm not that guy, but there does have to be intelligent discourse. We do have to discuss these things. We can't just turn away and you know, check, check Snapchat or what have you. Mm -hmm. you know, discussion, discussion and talking as humans and understanding each other and maybe disagreeing, but you know, intelligent discourse is the key at this point. It's, it's essential for the, for the survival of humanity. Well said. We'll leave it there. Um, thank you both so much for the conversation. Um, and all the best. And you better get those other novels or something else off the hard drive, because uh, uh, you're going to get a lot of uh, people wanting more from you, Omar. Thanks to both of you. That's Omar al and Tamo Peniket, and their book is American War. All right, let's bring out Julie Black, who is defending the Marrow Thieves by Cherie Dimaline. All right, guys. You're going to have to lift y'all right back up now. <laughs> <laughs> it was heavy. Okay. Too heavy. So. <laughs> Sheesh. Like we're going to have to offer vitamin D drops with that book there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are you guys having fun together, Cherie? 
How's this been? This we're last having a fantastic time. Yeah. I pretty much, I'm just like in neutral right now, like Julie Black, ladies oh, and gentlemen. Like, uh, <laughs> 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 All right, so we are still in the future though with, uh, with your book, Sheree. Tell, so an intriguing premise um, to The Marrow Thieves. I'm gonna let you describe um, the future that your characters find themselves in. So the book finds us about 50 years in the future, and, uh, and, and it does get a little bit dark here, but uh, at this time there's been some pretty cataclysmic climate change, uh, there's been some uh, distrust and falling apart of the government, if you can begin to imagine that. Um, <laughs> and so as a result of all this change, uh, a few things have happened. One of them is that we know when the north melts and the water levels rise that the shape of the continents will change. And so we'll have this new migration uh, into the central areas, which will cause a lot of this dis disheveling. Um, the second thing that happens is that the general population um, loses the ability to dream, uh, except for indigenous people who live in North America. Um, and so this ability to dream is rumored to exist in the marrow of our bones. Um, and we know that when we can't dream, uh, there's some pretty uh, horrific mental health issues that, that start to occur. And so the new government realizes that in order to control the population, to govern these people, they must give them the ability to dream back. Um, and so what happens is uh, they decide, okay, we need to round up, we need to corral these dreamers, the indigenous people, and we need to keep them in a place where we know that place in, it, in and of itself is not gonna take the dreams away from them because we need to harvest them. Um, and then they realize, oh, you know what, we've done this before. It's called residential schools. And so they reopen the residential school system because they know they can corral and that the dreams, which of course is hope, that hope will, will you know, be retained. And so we, the main character is Frenchie. He's a 15 year old Métis boy and his newfound family, uh, they're on the run. They're, on, they're heading north. North is where it's rumored. There's safety. There's a lot of indigenous people. There's freedom. Um, and so the story uh, does have a darker premise, but, but the real message of it is that even in this dark time, even in this you know, horrific change, even being chased, even being captured, that this community uh, lives and loves, falls and loves, falls together, you know, builds kinship, um, because we all know um, that if there's anyone that's going to survive an apocalypse, it would be the people who already have. <laughs> okay. She's, she describes it well. Uh, so what drew you to the story? You, you, you were saying earlier that um, part of what you think is cool about this is that this isn't, I think what you said is that you wouldn't necessarily have picked this book off a shelf if you were at a bookstore. Yeah, you're right. So Just look at the title and the cover and be like, oh yeah, let me do that. This is a good old Julie Black book. Nah, I started reading <laughs> for keeping it real. Um, what drew me to this book in particular uh, is the story of hope. And um, you know, I, my mom just passed away two months ago, and I was given the book within that time and uh, reading the stories of perseverance and hope and love and and um, really looking at your looking at the events that's happening and how your your the, how you think about the events in your life really create the feeling, and that feeling creates the belief system. And that belief system creates a pattern, and that pattern creates a habit. So it helped me with my grief, in fact. Right? right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm 60 days, 61 days since I buried my best friend. And my goodness, reading this story and reading about a 15 year old. And about, how old was, uh, was uh, Minerva? Minerva was in her 70s. Right. You know, you, you hear, you, come on, the wisdom of a 15 year old, the wisdom of a 70 plus year old. I, I, I lived that experience. My mom was 81 years old and she always said the spirit has no age. And so there's so much beauty and yumminess in this book that everybody can relate to. And um, I really think it's, it's time for us all to, to, even through fiction, there's like, there's little niblets of truth in there and the stories being told through an amazing Shiro. Uh, it's, it's inspired me to read more, look into this more and speak about it more, use my platform however I can. To, uh, to get to know the indigenous people. And it's interesting, uh, I mean, another aspect, perhaps wh why you mightn't have picked it up 
on your own. Is, so this is a, a, a YA novel, a young adult novel. It Tell is, me yeah. about, about the significance of that, do you think? That doesn't, I mean, it has happened in, in uh, you know, books, competitions like this before, but tell me about the significance of pr originally writing for a younger audience. Mm. Um, so when I started the story, I was asked to write, uh, contribute to an anthology of indigenous science fiction. I'd never written science fiction before, and I thought, oh my God, like, where do I go? How do I start this? And I, 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 mean, I mean, that being said, I read a Nala Hopkins and Brown Girl in the Ring, which was revolutionary. Pick up that book, it's incredible. Um, and so I was, you know, sort of reaching, you know, how, how am I going to do this? Who am I writing this for? And as soon as I asked myself that question, who am I writing this for, I, I knew that, you know, if I was going to talk about a dystopian future, um, that it had to be for young people. And first and foremost, it was for Indigenous youth. Um, I've done a lot of work uh, in communities. I've been incredibly lucky to work with a lot of really tremendous uh, Métis communities and First Nations. And um, a lot of work with the youth, and there's, you know, there's a suicide ep epidemic happening that has been happening. And I talked to some of these, these kids in these youth groups, and I realized that they didn't see themselves. They didn't see themselves as adults. Mm. They didn't see themselves in the future. And so I wanted to give them a place and a time and a circumstance where they were not just surviving, but where they were thriving and where they were the heroes and they were the answer. Um, so first and foremost, it was, it was for them. And so that's how when the, it developed from the short story into the book, I thought, I was asked that question, you know, do you want it to be young adult or adult? Because quite honestly, there's, you know, there's more, if you go adult, you'll have more, there's more chance for awards and, you know, whatever bestseller lists. And I thought, I can't, I can't change this. This is too important uh, of, of a, a gift, uh, really a gift that they gave me and that I hopefully reflected back. And then the beautiful thing that I didn't even think about was, you know, I've been traveling a lot into classrooms all over Canada and talking to all youth, non-Indigenous youth. And these kids are remarkable, like terrifying, first of all, if you're going to talk to <laughs> high school kids. Oh my God, right? I'm like, they're, are they gonna put their phone down? Are they gonna judge my shoes? Like, what's gonna happen? And they, they did a little bit, but then we got over it. Um, <laughs> And they asked these questions, like, these are your children. They you know, would listen to me talk for 10, 15 minutes, and I'm just talking about the book. I'm not giving them a political lesson and you know, putting up their hands. How do I be a better ally without taking up space and resources in the indigenous community? These are 12-year-old kids, mm. you know? Like, There's the this hope. Is, there, there is hope, and that's what was given back to me, truly was these kids, these Canadian kids, reflecting back to me that they understood that they are compassionate, that they're empathetic, and it's not just empathy, it's true allyship. Mm. And so that was really exciting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Julie, um, just quickly, I, I'm curious, you know, you mentioned the timing of this book coming to you when you were in a pretty um, devastated state um, having well, lost I your mom. I should have been in a devastated state. No, when, you, when you lost your mom. Yeah, it wasn't devastating. Oh, okay. And oh. I say that to oh. say, okay. you know, I, I, it's coming for everybody. I spent time with my mom mm. and not just the last days. And so I think death is something and death and, you know, it, there is a death in the book, you know, and it's like, yeah, it, it, grief falls upon you and it goes away. Mm. And you can't cry for 24 hours straight. Right? And so I think that through our words, our thoughts, our actions, and this is, again, this, this book is like, this by my, by my new Bible or something, girlfriend. <laughs> um, I learned a lot in here on how to handle adversity. Well, I was going to ask you, I mean, how, what it meant to you to have that connection with Shireen, you know, somebody whose words, you know, came to you at a pretty significant time in your life. Yeah, you absolutely. Yeah, I believe that we attracted one another, and um, I think we all should recognize more how, it's not even religion, like how powerful our words are and our thoughts actually are I, we totally like manifested one another so i hope you got the winning loud number too because girl <laughs> uh, you know could win some well we when we met each other <laughs> when we met each other we were you know all having lunch and we're it, it's you know nerve-wracking all the authors are meeting the panelists and it's exciting and i saw julie walk in and i was like oh shit there's julie black and i'm really intimidated i'm just eating and then i'm like okay well now you've waited two minutes now it's going to be awkward when you go and say hi <laughs> 
I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, after this piece of bread, then I'm gonna go. <laughs> and so I finally walked over and I'm going to tap her. I'm like, are you Julie? Of course it's Julie, right? <laughs> are you Julie? She's like, yes. I'm like, I'm Cherie. She's like, you are. Oh my God. And then we immediately started crying. And I don't know what everyone else thought. They were probably like, relax. Right. Like, but it was, it was, it was real. Like it's, uh, I really feel like, you know. Yeah, you, I think we can all feel it as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's so great to get the chance to talk with you guys a little bit. All the best in the debates. And uh, as we Thank said you. to the others, you know, you hand it over to Julie from here. Your work is done. Yeah. yeah. Thanks okay. to both of no you guys. Pressure. Thank you. Love you guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Julie Black defending the Marrow Thieves by Cherie Dimelein. All right, the fourth book uh, we're going to talk about tonight, another uh, nonfiction book. Please join me in welcoming Greg Johnson back to the stage, who will be defending Craig Davidson's book, Precious Cargo. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hello, how are you? Okay, I, we're definitely seeing a pattern is here. emerging here. <laughs> the two best friends that there ever were. Oh my God. <laughs> we met yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> if only you were getting along. Um, so, um, Craig, a lot of, let me start with you as I've been doing, asking the um, you know, authors to talk about their books. Um, a lot of people, I think a lot of people in this country know you for your writing, you've, uh, you've written all kinds of books in different genres, you've been shortlisted for the Giller, you wrote what became the basis for the, nov uh, the film, um, Rust and Bone. Um, in this book, though, this is so different, you're something else, you are a bus driver in this book. We know you as a writer, but in this book, you, you, you write because of something that you were doing utterly different than writing. So tell me how that all happened, that you became a bus driver. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I came into it uh, from the vector of deep personal and professional failure. <laughs> um, I, uh, as you said, those, the, the first couple books came out, this, the first of which was Rust and Bone, the second of which was a book called The Fighter, and um, through no fault of my publisher, completely fault of my own and the hubris that only a 30-year-old man can have, uh, I thought it was a wonderful book, and the world uh, disabused me of that notion <laughs> uh, to the point that, you know, nobody wanted to be really in the Craig Davidson business anymore. Uh, and so I was grappling with uh, well, how to make a living, basically. How, how, how am I going to, you know, keep a roof over my head? And after a string of uh, calamitous uh, work episodes, uh, I really came home after one and found in my um, mailbox a flyer that said, bus drivers wanted. And it said, no training necessary, or sorry, we will give training. I thought, oh, good. <laughs> no training, yeah, just get in a bus and go. Uh, uh, and I thought, well, you know, I think I, in the book I, I said something along the lines of, you know, here, here are two desperate, uh, you know, sinking ocean liners throwing <laughs> life preservers at each other. So I grabbed onto it and uh, went in, and, uh, and, and sooner or later I was on, on the road. But of course, the, the difference being is I expected I was going to be in a, uh, you know, drive a 50, 60, 70 seat big bus, and I was going to be um, the faceless bus driver that had nothing to do with my, uh, the charges that I drove. Um, but just through a geographical quirk, um, the closest route to me w would be a route for children with special needs. And, uh, you know, I, th I thought about it before, before accepting, and I think the things that went through my mind are the things that probably go through the mind of a lot of people in this audience or a lot of people who, were, were they given that opportunity? Um, more or less, they centered around, am I the right type of person to do this? And I settled on the notion that, listen, Craig, try, and if you're not the right type of person, um, gracefully find a different vector and, and, and go and do a different kind of a job. But as it turned out, um, y you know, it was, I'm not going to say transformative, that's, that's almost too big, but it was, it was, it was, um, it was an experience that ch changed me. Um, and it was one that came through failure and it, 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 um, it was the, other than, other than meeting my wife and the birth of my child, it was the luckiest 
thing that I've ever had happen to me. Hmm. Can you tell us a bit more about, I mean, people are going to read the book, but a little bit more about this, this precious cargo, this exceptional group of kids that you were driving? Sure, I can. I, I think the main thing, too, it's, it's obviously uh, Greg and I have been um, doing a lot of talking uh, w um, amongst each other and to interviewers. Uh, and one thing that Greg said earlier today is he had to remind me, it's like, the book is funny. You know, and, and I, I, you know, I can say that uh, not because I'm tooting my own horn, because I really was more like, a, you know, an orchard keeper. It was there were these uh, trees full of fruit and all that I was doing was going and, and it was falling into my hands and I gathered it up. And, and all of the, all the, the all, really all of the funny bits, all of the, uh, the melancholy bits, all of the beautiful bits. Um, I, I just harvest, harvested sounds terrible, but I, 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 those, the, the kids gave them to me. You know, th those weren't things that I came up with. That was just, you find yourself around kids, and anyone who works with kids or teaches kids recognize that kids see the world at a skew, at an angle, uh, in a way that adults can't. We lose it somewhere. And to be around uh, kids who think like kids and, and the beautiful, hilarious, strange way that their, their brains process things, um, it couldn't have come along at a better time, and I think when the book works, and it works best, it's when I just allow those kids to say the things that they told me mm -hmm. on that bus. Um, Greg, you've, as I mentioned earlier, you've got a pretty interesting job yourself. Um, you're a storm chaser. What, so what appealed to you about, uh, about this book and this um, well, <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I actually think Craig's kind of underselling it a little bit. Uh, the That's your job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, the, the book is funny. Um, it, you know, it, it's relatable. And I think that's the part that uh, people, when they read it, are really going to uh, take from it. It's I mean, everyone who reads the book will know one of these characters from their own life. And um, the character that I most resonated with was actually uh, the author and, and the, 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 you know, the, the character in the book, which is actually Craig. It's, I guess it's autobiographical in a way. And uh, so uh, we all have experienced failure, right? We all have gone through those times in our lives when we go, okay, it's not getting worse than this. Um, mine was the, uh, the spaghetti and butter running out, and that was the only food that was left in the, in the cupboard. And uh, we all get to that point at, at, at some point in our life. And, and I really understood where Craig was with the, you know, the, tell them about the worm job. Like, he literally... <laughs> He literally didn't get the job picking worms. <laughs> With a university degree. Um, you know, and, and we, we all can relate to failure. We can all relate to... <laughs> <laughs> we can all relate to the struggle. Uh, and I knew right away as soon as I started reading it that, that, that I would love the book. And it is funny. Um, but, but there is a theme, and, and I don't even, like, I haven't even actually heard you say it in any of the interviews, but um, I took from it the, this idea of empathy, and I think empathy runs throughout the book, and uh, I actually think empathy might be the last word in the book, and th for me, that's, that's the thing that's missing right now, I believe, in our society. I mean, I, we came a long way, and then the last let's call it 18 months, right? Things have uh, kind of gone backwards a little bit. And uh, I think right now, the, the theme being one book to open our eyes. And, and um, I really think this book will open people's eyes to uh, how we treat people, how we treat each other. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be the messenger uh, for an incredible book and an, 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 an incredible guy. Hmm. Uh, also, also... Craig and I are in the heat of a very, very intense bromance um, <laughs> that's been brewing for the last 48 yeah, hours. It's reaching a fever pitch right now. Yeah. I mean, Craig, he started by saying, you know, how th th that this book came, and he well, the experience that um, this book is about came to you at a, at a, you know, a point in your life when, when things were really down. How does it feel right now, I mean, to have somebody who's going on to a national stage to champion your book with such appreciation and, and connection and to have thousands of readers across the country, you know,
picking up this story now. I mean, where, where do you feel you're at now on that trajectory uh, that you described one low point of? Where do you feel, how do you feel about being at a very different point now? Well, it's about time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, you know, the truth is when the long list came out, um, that was a very, that's a, it, was, it was a wonderful long list. And I think um, anybody who, who follows books and, and follows awards, whether it's in books or anything, would, would recognize that um, on a different day and a different set of parameters, five different books could be on the short list. As, as good as I think the books that are on it, um, uh, it just, it, the country is putting out wonderful uh, literature right now, wonderful literature, wonderful nonfiction. So, I mean, ultimately for me, I can just be grateful that I'm a, that I'm a part of this, uh, recognize how lucky I am to, to be here with these four other wonderful books and, and their supporters, and, um, you know, and enjoy the ride, because you never, you never know if it's coming back. So just treat it as though it never will come back, and enjoy the ride while it lasts. Well, you got a good companion on the ride with you. Thanks so much to both of you guys for Thank being you. here. All the best. Greg Johnson, Defending Precious Cargo by Craig Davidson. All right. Our final duo. Come on out to the stage. Please join me in welcoming singer-songwriter, Afghan-Canadian activist, Mojda Jamaljada, and also Sharon Bala, who is the author of The Boat People. All right, ladies, so last but most certainly not least, the boat people. Um, Sharon, I'm going to start with you. Tell us a bit about, because your novel originated with true events, so maybe you can start by talking a little bit about what inspired you to write it. Uh, yes, but since we're the last ones here, and Mark began by thanking everyone at the CBC, I just want to extend that and say we've all spent the last two days together holed up here. And I want to say that in addition to the CBC, it's been so lovely to be here with all the other authors and all the other um, champions. And I feel like we are already winners. That's so cheesy, mm. but anyway. No, but it's true. Um, so in the fall of 2010, I was in Halifax at Pier 21, which is the Canadian Immigration Museum. And I was walking through and looking at all the exhibits that document the waves upon waves of different people who've come to this country and come through Halifax. For a very long time, that was the main port, people coming in before air travel was common. And I was thinking about um, how we've welcomed all these people. And at the same time, on the other side of the country, this uh, cargo ship had arrived, the MV Sun Sea, which was carrying almost 500 Sri Lankan Tamil refugees who had escaped the civil war and had come here. And our government was trying very hard to slam the door in their faces. And there was this sentence on the wall at Pier 21. It was something that an anonymous immigration official had said to someone. You've come to a good country. There's room for you here. And I thought, what kind of a country have these Tamil people come to? Is there room for them here? And my family is also from Sri Lanka. We also left because of the war. My father is Tamil, so I'm Tamil, half, half Tamil. And I thought about how the country welcomed us in the mid 80s, how it was a good country. It took care of us and we did our best by them. And I thought, you know, in just a couple of decades, how things have turned. So that was the inspiration for the book. Mm. Um, and Mojda, tell me a little bit about your, um, I mean, your own personal family experience, your family came to Canada from Afghanistan as refugees. So tell me about the parallels there and what you related to and connected with in the book. Oh, wow. Um, it was an instant hit with me, this book, and it really pulled up my heartstrings and just, you know, reminded me, I think, after a while of being here, you just get so comfortable and maybe forget a little bit of the struggles that people face uh, coming here. Um, and leaving everything behind. So as soon as I read the, the summary, I was like, I definitely want to you know, read this. And when I read the first few pages, I knew that I connected with it immediately. Um, my, my parents 
and, uh, and I left when I was five years old, five or six. Um, of course, the war in Afghanistan has been ongoing. It's been over four decades now. And so um, at that time, in around the 19, uh, late 1980s, uh, 1989, when my parents decided to flee, they had no choice because, you know, they, my, my dad's life was uh, being threatened. And so when we escaped through the mountainous terrain at that time, the uh, Soviet um, fighter jets were flying over and at any point in time we could have been hit because anyone who was um, escaping, you know, that was their thing. They would, they would just bombard that area. So they really took a big risk and um, everything that they've been through, like everything that they suffered through, this book just brought all that back for me. And I think like as a child, going through that, maybe I didn't feel it as much as my parents did. They knew what being a refugee was way more than me. And when I read this book, I realized what they had gone through to get us here to safety. You know, so it made me appreciate just being a Canadian so much more and not taking this for granted. Did your, um, what did your parents think of when they read your book, Sharon? Oh, um, my mother actually read the first draft uh, a long time ago, and then she got to read one of the final drafts. And she said it really stayed with her. And what was nice for me, actually, was that my mother um, said that the second draft, the final draft, had improved quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I will say this. I mean, the feedback I got from my mom, who's not a writer but is a reader, it was the same feedback that everyone gave me, my agent, my editor, the other readers I had, the other writers. So I think I'm hoping that all of the changes that I made make the book accessible to any Canadian reader. Hmm. Um, and for my father, it was his first novel. It's the only novel he's ever read. Really? Oh. He's here, I'm outing him. <laughs> 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 he reads nonfiction. Hmm. <laughs> but for you. <laughs> What's that? What well, did you this say? This is what my dad does. He's, just, he's defending himself. I, yeah, do, I do read yeah. nonfiction. <laughs> yeah. That's what my dad's saying. You don't have to read any other books, just mine. That's not true. Uh, That's not true. <laughs> read all of the books, they're all wonderful. <laughs> hey, you can say what you want because you don't have to be part of the panelists. It's your first novel. I mean, it is. It is. this must feel like. <laughs> Does this all feel a little heady for you? After uh, this is the most makeup that like, <laughs> I've ever worn. And my hair doesn't look this way. And I don't dress like this. I was joking that I have one nice, out like, one nice dress and one ni nice pants set. <laughs> I know you guys were talking backstage. I, I stumbled by a, a conversation when I first went, went and said hello backstage. You guys were talking about, you know, paying attention to feedback from uh, online, yeah. on book sites and things. Um, and Mojda had some advice for you yes. about... I was encouraging her to read the reviews because ever since I got this book, I've been obsessed. I'm on my phone just like reading reviews and, <laughs> and I'm kidding, you know, you, you just, there's different um, perspectives and it just gives you like a different lens to look through. Mm. Um, when you're reading this book, and it, it's nice to see all those, um, you know, uh, I guess everything that, um, how it resonates with people. And I told Sharon, I said, are you reading the reviews? I asked her, and she said, no, I'm staying far away. I said, why not? She's like, why? Well, you know, in case there's like a negative review. <laughs> I said, that's bound to happen, but you're going to get a lot out of, you know, the good reviews. And you might not even have thought about how it would impact some lives and change, you know, the perspectives and Because I, I was thinking about that after, you know, you mentioned it, I was thinking you're about to witness your book being more than reviewed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Into the fire. You're going to see your book being picked apart by people only because they have to um, in order to try to make theirs win. Do you plan to not listen or watch Canada Reads or are you going to, are you going to, how are you going to handle that, Sharon? It's funny because the writers have been discussing this and after last night we just kind of went for a drink and we took a little poll and I said I think I, regardless of what I want to do, I'm going to have to watch and listen because 
I just know my friends are going to be the jerks who keep texting me, did you see what she said? Did you hear what he said? <laughs> and so it's just, I won't be able to get away from it. It's true. But I think it is going to be baptism by fire, so. <laughs> How do you feel, Moshe, about the book's chances? Uh, you know, again, I don't want to, you know, we're not getting into strategy yet. We're saving all that for March. But I'm not telling you the strategy. You <laughs> no, she has one. <laughs> oh, she has a strategy. Oh, good. Um, you know, at this point, early days, how do you feel? You know what? I'm so confident in this book. Um, I don't know about Miss Julie Black. She's <laughs> she's scaring me a little bit. <laughs> but um, but it's it's all for you know it's just preparing me more um, for the actual day. But um, I'm so confident in this book because first of all, I am so passionate about this. Um, the reason that I'm passionate about it is because I was a refugee myself, so I connected with it immediately. And another thing is that. I think that it's a very, very relevant book. Right now, we are have, we, the world is facing the worst refugee crisis in history. It's become worse than World War II. And the thing is that Canada has been one of the best nations when it comes to accepting and welcoming immigrants um, throughout history, even though, yeah, there's been some times where it's been a little bit, um, you know, not so good. But for the majority of the part, if you compare to other countries, and, you know, I'm aware of, how other countries um, treat their, uh, you know, refugees and asylum seekers. I am very proud to be Canadian because we are so good that way uh, as a nation. Also, uh, I think a reason is because a lot of us um, have been immigrants, you know, and this is a land of immigrants. We've all had our luck with the lottery at some point in history, whether it was our parents, our grandparents, you know, first generation, second, third, even our ancestors, we've come from someplace, somewhere, uh, most of us. So I think that it is a very, very relevant book for Canadians to read, and it would definitely make an impact on their lives and get, give them a chance to see, you know, have different perspectives mm. and see it through a different lens. All right. Well, so great to get to talk to you about it. Thank you both so Thank much. Thank you so much, Joe. All the best in the debates. Moshe Jamalzada and Sharon Bala, um, thanks you guys for uh, sharing the boat people. That's it. That is, uh, brings our event to a wrap. There's obviously lots more. Um, you can, we've whet your appetite tonight and uh, there's lots to look at and learn about all the books and the events around Canada Reads, which of course happened the last week of March. Go to cbc.ca slash Canada Reads for all the info. All five books now that you're so keen to read them all, as I am, uh, are available for purchase outside in uh, the lobby. If you're listening from the atrium, come on by and, um, and grab a copy there. And you can reserve a spot right now to attend the Canada Reads events like this one. It has limited space, so make sure you reserve your spot. It is, um, it's quite a show. Uh, so make sure you get to be part of that. And again, cbc.ca slash Canada Reads is the place to get the details. And you can always tune in to Here and Now on your radio, 99.1 weekday afternoons, uh, where I will be bringing you up to date between now and the end of March on lots of Canada Reads going on too. So thank you so much for being here. And, uh, and happy reading. <laughs>